So there's nothing they can do to stop it. You've just got to give them market value for the club. There is, under this model, which is very bold and very radical, there is nothing the Glazers can do. Is football broken and how can we fix it? I'm joined by Mickey Peaker, the author of Football, The People's Shame, How to Revolutionise a National Sport. And you have come up with a pretty radical idea and that is to take power away from the big businesses and the multinational corporations that currently pretty much run British football and give that power and control back to the fans, essentially. The model we're going to talk about is a new form of public ownership. It's called a public commons partnership. So every football club will become a public commons partnership. A public commons partnership is owned partially by the state, but the, the percentage is not like the German thing, 4951. It's much less than that. You could have it at 10%, 90%. Uh, and the uh, the common association, which is commoners, pe people who pay in, supporting members, will own, let's say, 80%, 90% of the club. Uh, but the common, basically, common public commons partnerships are run, managed uh, slightly differently. They're owned by two entities, the state and the people. Uh, but they're run, they're governed differently. They're governed by, they're all merged with councils. Not in a way that the council will tell us what to do, but in a way that we'll tell the council what to do, you know, for building things or projects or whatever. Uh, so you've got the, the, the council, the local council, the local authority, the common association, which is a group of members. Uh, you know, it'll be a big group of members for Manchester United. Uh, and you've got the joint enterprise as well. So this is how they're governed. The joint enterprise is basically a, a body of, of relevant experts in a particular field. So in, in, with regards to football, there'll be, a, uh, you know, a team of specialists who can run a football club, a bit like what we've got now. Yeah. But I suppose the best way to do it would be, would be via elections. And by the way, democracy does create problems. You know, th this is going to be problematic. I'd pro you know, you could have it, you, you could choose how to do it. Do you want the fans to pick the team? You know, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, or do you want to do it every 10 years, every five years? But the idea is this, if something's going really wrong and you're not happy, fans can vote out, you know, um, board officials. They could, you could even choose to vote out managers, but uh, Hearts Foundation, so I'm going to use a very quick example of Hearts up in Scotland, they're now fan owned okay. and they have a mantra and it's this, the club is fan owned but not fan run. So and I think that's quite a good mantra to have because if fans run clubs it could get ridiculous. Mm. But the idea is this, you've got power, your voice counts, everybody's voice is equal. So looking at sort of you mentioned Hearts and you sort of briefly mentioned Germany there and, and the way do th they do things. What examples of this or this type of thing are there out there? What is the German model? You mentioned 4951 and it's a phrase I, I you hear a lot of like 51% fan ownership and then 49% other um, and obviously that depends on which club you're looking at. Um, but what does that mean and, and how does it work in, in other places and, and has it worked successfully in other places? Uh, well, the, the places where democracy uh, is, is, is being used to run football, these places are protecting that model. Argentina is another one. These places are protecting it. In Germany, they've got something called, um, I can't pronounce it, but you, know, you say curve or something like that. It's, it's, what they've got over there is, is, is a bit different to us. They've got a really highly politicised kind of fandom. They've got uh, supporters groups across the, 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 the country that, that join together and fight commercial interests. They've also got 50 plus one stays because private equity, businessmen, they're looking to get into football. Mm. They're looking to get into German football. They're trying the best. Uh, but they're closing the door on them, these, the German fans, because they love the fact they've got control of their own clubs. Democracy is worth fighting for. So the way I've um, positioned it is slightly different. It's a new radical idea. It's, it would be a public commons partnership merged with the council. And the idea is this, we, we'd have billions of pounds going in um, and we'd have to decide what to do with it because the main thing here is, is broadcasting as well. Mm. We can talk about the political way of doing this in a, in a bit, but broadcasting's massive. They're doing it completely wrong. At the moment, what you've got is a really fractured, inefficient model. So the Premier League just sells rights to across the world, and then people, uh, sorry, regional buyers buy it up and market it and, and sell it to their part of the world. It's really fractured. There's 200 million people who pay to watch Premier League football. A lot of them are United fans, you know. Um, and if you charge them all 10 pound a month, that's 24 billion pound a year. So the idea is this, you do it from a single source. You stream it digitally. Amazon are already doing it. Mm. In the MLS, the technology already exists because they're in bed with Apple. Apple now stream 
as a single source MLS to the rest of the world. So the Premier League could be doing this. They're already thinking about doing this. But this is an, also a great opportunity for, for Great Britain because we've got no digital tech infrastructure. We, every, everything we have is owned by Americans. So this is a great opportunity. Create a digital tech company that's mm. capable of delivering football, streaming it online. Amazon do it amazingly. Mm. To the rest of the world, you can have... A, an, a, because it's, there's only one company doing it, it's harder to hack. So you, there's quite a few hundred million people hacking Premier League football, you know. So you probably have a lot more than 200 million people doing this. Mm. £10 a month, really affordable. Uh, uh, Premier League wages are about three and a half billion, as, as they stand now. And this system, this uh, thing costs about 500 million to run a year. So straight away, you've got 20 billion pound worth of surplus profits there. So just by thinking about broadcasting in a different way, we, we've, we've basically streamlined the business model and we could democratise um, broadcasting. Broadcasting itself will become a public commons partnership. And this is really easy to take. You can take broadcasting for free. You just wait to the end of a contract cycle. Mm. What, what, so what needs to happen for, for this to come in? Because immediately my head's going, the owners are going to hate this. Mm -hmm. The broadcasting companies are going to hate this. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the... Um, obviously, we know that there are relationships behind the scenes between football owners and the government already, whether that be sort of, you know, officially or unofficially. Maybe not, you know, all the sort of political or politicians in the country are quite as uh, squeaky clean as some people might think they are. These things are going on behind the scenes. How... What would actually have to happen for this to take place? And aren't... You know, every Premier League owner and Sky Sports and BT or TNT going to come at you with lawsuit after lawsuit trying to stop this. How, yeah. how could it actually happen, if you know what I mean? Well, we're also going to annoy um, gambling companies who are very powerful lobbyists as well, because we're going to set up this really obvious idea of a public gambling company as well, and a public brewery. And we're going to take shirt manufacturing as well into public ownership. So this is uh, going to upset the apple cart, and there's a lot of powerful lobbying groups in the way. The government don't want to do it. The Premier League doesn't want to do it. The FA don't want to do it. Uh, nobody wants to do it in positions of power. So you're asking, how do we even begin yeah. to get this over the line? And it's a good question. Uh, the only way this can work is through mass support. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a political party. Uh, it, we might not even need a political party to get this over the line. And the idea is this, we're not going to communicate with the Glazers. We're not going to communicate with anybody in positions of power because the, literally the, the power's in our hands if we stand together. You know, your club's called United, and that's what it's about, being united. English football, I mean, as, as uh, far-fetched as this may seem, this is possible. And that, don't get me wrong, in 2025, you know, this is not ready to win, but it's ready to begin. The idea is to build, plant the seed, and grow, grow political pressure. You have to remove um, club owners. There's only one way you can do it, through Acts of Parliament. It's the only way to do it. Mm. And beneficially... We saw what happened with Chelsea and... Um, Abramovich didn't we? I know that was obviously very different yeah, yeah. but it, it's, it is possible for the government to step in and say yeah, you don't own this club anymore all the people you've yeah. just described that are in the way of this and they are in the way and they're powerful people the government sits above them all so it, by creating political pressure this is how you do it we could have created our own political party that says to hell with you we don't need you we, we've got a new model and we're going to implement it you do it through um, acts of parliament Brexit makes this legally possible which is really exciting. You know, I'm not here to discuss Brexit and say whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but inside the EU, the Glazers could ap apply to the European Court and it makes this really messy and drawn out. But outside the EU, which we are legally, all that red tape is gone. So we don't have to uh, abide by any of it. The only thing we've got to abide by is the European Court of Human Rights, which says this in terms of, it, because this is about nationalization. Football is only a small industry. I mean, I, I'll come back to the European Court of Human Rights um, in a second and what we have to do, adhere to. It's a really tiny industry. Uh, uh, its cultural significance overshadows that. Yes, it's very emotional, very culturally significant. Economically, it's tiny. You can buy every single football club in England for two-thirds the price of Track and Trace. Track and Trace was £37 billion. Mm. If you get football clubs at the lower end, it's £25 billion. It's the worth somewhere between collectively 25 and 30 billion. The Elizabeth Line in London, they've just built it, 22 billion pounds. Mm. HS2, this is not a tangent, because I'll be able to link it into what I'm saying. HS2 was supposed to come to Manchester, it's a train line from London to Birmingham. They've obviously they've messed it up because they're, they're useless, the contracting's been terrible. 
that's cost £70 billion. And obviously, it's stopping in Birmingham. It's not coming to Sheffield, Leeds, Manchester, Newcastle. Um, you know, it's just a London-centric policy, like, like everything is these days in this country. So you have that figure in your head, £70 billion. That's a lot of money. Mm. We can buy football clubs for £30 billion. If you're in the way of HS2, your house gets taken off you. Because we're going back to nationalisation and the European Court of Human Rights. You can nationalise businesses, you can nationalise anything you want. There's two things you've got to do. You've got to do it in the public interest and you've got to do it according to the law, legally. So here we are, this is massively in the public interest. Yeah. And legally, it's actually weighted on the side of the state. This legally, it's a legal term, the public interest. It's, so it, this is massively in the public interest and you can do it legally by acts of parliament. So there's nothing they can do to stop it. You've just got to give them market value for the club. There is, under this model, which is very bold and very radical, there is nothing the Glazers can do. They have to swallow it. Mm. It's interesting as well you say about the sort of in the public interest and a lot, a lot of people will be watching thinking, you know, maybe if they're not United fans, thinking like, well, you know, look at City's owners, look, they've come in and they've won everything. We want that and this would take away the potential for that to happen. But for every one City story, there's far more Boltons, Berries and Portsmouths where, or, you know, Sheffield Wednesdays where the, the owner comes in, spends money they don't have or sells themselves their own stadium or puts the club in a load of debt. I mean, even United, on, on the pitch, we've still been one of the more successful teams in the last decade, despite it being a sort of poor decade. Mm -hmm. we won a handful of trophies more than a lot of teams. But like you mentioned before, the amount of debt that the club is in, the fact that the rules have now been changed so that the way United was bought can no longer happen. It shows that you know anyone or no one is sorry is, is sort of immune from owners coming in and acting in their own interest rather than the interest of the club and the community, and therefore you know basically ruining or potentially ruining the, the team that they own, which is which happens way more often than wow look at City they, they used to be in the, the first division and now they win everything. That's that's the anomaly here, isn't it? Yeah, what you've just described is ridiculous. I mean, what I've uh, what what I've come to realize, am I an insane person in the same world, or am I a sane person in an insane world? And when you look at football, I think it's mm. the latter. Now you, you've just described what uh, you know the way that all these stupid loopholes and the way that they've said, oh, that can't happen anymore. The whole thing's really complex. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't need to be. You can, you can stabilise and, and simplify the financial landscape. Go back to how the Victorians did football. They had a wage cap. Everything was fair. They um, shared gate receipts. This is how football was. Because football's about... Um, it's not about big business. It's about fair competition it's about integrity that's how the victorians saw football they implemented rule 34 now my united fans who went to fc united i think they argued about rule 34 uh, it's not in the cultural consciousness this rule 34 the victorians uh, it created it to protect football clubs from financial profiteers now rule 34 meant you can't take money out of football clubs mm. that's the shareholders weren't allowed to pay themselves dividends uh, and, and if a club was ever liquidated, which was very rare, all the money had to go to charity. The key year in English football is 1983. That's when Rule 34 was first bypassed by Irving Scholar, who was then chairman, chairman of Spurs. He handed it to Sugar in 85. So all this has happened um, behind closed doors. People don't know what's actually happened to English football. Mm. So now football clubs, they were never PLCs. They were never typical public, public limited companies. It's easy for me to say. But they, they were done by, they were, they were community assets. All that's finished now, it's gone. But you look at the Americans as well, the modern Americans, how they see sport is the same as the Victorians. The NFL, the weakest teams get the first draft. Mm. It's all done to create good, fair competition. All that's out the window now with the, with the Premier League. We're frozen in time. We're at the end of history. There's no other team that can win because the, the UEFA, the Premier League, they've all seen the advantage to the big commercial clubs because the big commercial clubs, along with A22, threaten the European Super League. And now UEFA have gone, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, you know, we've, we want to be involved. So the, the, the European Super League is now happening through UEFA, essentially, as the monopolisation process distorts people's mindsets. It's totally ridiculous. There's a different way to do this. My idea is this, wage cap. Straight away you think, whoa, no. There's two ways to get around the fact that world-class players might not play in the Premier League, which yeah. is what it's all about. And we need world-class players, otherwise that global brand has gone. First of all, up the wages massively. So I, I've gone with five and a half billion. I've added two billion. 
And the second failsafe is this, the designated player rule. You can sign three players outside it, or is it four or is it five? This is how they signed Beckham in the MLS, because mm. the MLS have got a wage cap. They say they've got a limit on squad size, which is a great idea. And my idea is this, play local boys. You've got to play two local lads that were born in these hospitals. Mm. All, all, all times on the pitch. Is it three? Is it one? Is it four? That's a, a platform for a debate. You know, that, that it's a new debate. You tie teams to locality. Yes, you've got global stars, but you've also got the Manchester boys. Let's go back to the 1990s when arguably, yeah, it is the greatest area, you know, for Man United. You've got the buzz with, you know, 50s and stuff, but mm. that Man United team from, you know, 92, 93 up until the 99 uh, treble winning season, that was special. It was really special for a number of reasons. Number one, you haven't won it for 25, 26 years. Yep. That's special. And if you're winning it all the time, all the time, of course it's less special. The first time you win it, or when you haven't won it for a while, that's special. That's gone now with the way it is. Let's try and bring that back. The second thing, you had the class of 92. They had the local boys on the pitch. That was what made it so special. And we've got to go back to that model. And let's just talk about monopolization because this is interesting. You're talking about my United fans. You know, I know why you're frustrated because you, you, you feel humiliated because you don't, you're, not, you're not winning in a world where only winners matter. Mm. You're not, you don't, we don't stand for anything. I'm not having a go at my United fans. It's the same for us all. We don't stand for anything. Well, all we stand for is can we get the most money from the oil industry and win? Can we get the most money from America and win? It, it's vacuous. And I bet City have got this kind of like, you know, it's going really well for them now. But there is a vacuousness to it. Yeah. And when Pep goes, they are in your position now. The, the, you know, you, when he goes, their dominance is over. And they, and they become the next Man United as they are now. I, it's, there is a, there's a, a soullessness to all this. There really is. And let's talk about monopolization. When you won it in 96, 97, Kevin Keegan rant, the famous rant, you yeah. won it on 75 points. When you had the 1999 champions of Europe, you won it on 79 points. <sighs> City got 100. Yeah. Newcastle, uh, sorry, um, Liverpool finished second on 97. You know, this is ridiculous. There's only 114 points available in the Premier League. Mm. This is where we are now. I did a little bit of, just a little bit of digging. No one's done this research. Thinking big, thinking long term. The first 10 years of the Premier League, you could win it on average of 80, 80 points. Second 10 years, it goes up to 87. Third 10 years, it goes to 91. Uh, we're in the fourth decade now. Leicester is the only glitch. It's a, for some reason, the monopolization process faltered in that year. But in the seven seasons after Leicester's victory, yeah. the average is 95. So this is what we're talking about now. You can yeah. only drop 20 points. If you have a five game run, you lose one, win one, draw three, you've just dropped nine. It's not even that bad a run. I mean, yeah. th this is where we are. The whole thing has become ridiculous. And you know, Ipswich Town going up, uh, Southampton have come up, they're just getting battered mm. because the gap between the best and the rest has accelerated so much and we don't, and like I said, we don't stand for anything. And you know what, some Man United fans listening might be involved with FC United, which is really valiant kind of, you know, what they've done there. Um, they've left Man United, it's, a, it's, not, it's not attacking, it's a retreat. It, that, is, that is, you have gone away from Man United, you've given up, you've lost faith, you've yeah. totally given up on the club and formed your own club, that is not, uh, that is not attacking. That is, de that is not even defending. Mm. Well, and you know what? We, 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 Man United are one of the fan bases that do it, a lot, a lot sing this, attack, 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 attack. We expect our, you know, we want our players to show courage, want our players to be determined, want our players to go on the front foot, but we won't do it ourselves. You know, we're hypocrites. It's time to attack. It's time to draw a line and say no. Do you know what? We've got, there's no point in digging trenches because we've got nothing to protect. We've got absolutely nothing to lose. So let's stand. Let's, let's attack. I do, I, I do, obviously, the idea of, of fans owning the clubs and, like you said, having some kind of values that the club has. I mean, I think certain teams in particular but don't you know, have less than others, but I, I do think that there's a general issue of 
like you said, football is just about how can we get the most money as quickly as possible, spend that on the best players from around the world as quickly as possible, and win trophies. And all the, anything other than that is almost irrelevant, really. Yeah. There aren't really any other stories in football clubs outside of that. I mean, well, this is a story outside of that, mate. Yeah, of course. I mean, that, that, and this is what we need to build. Yeah. You need, to, be, you need to win on your own terms. You need to look inwards. When, when, you, when you talk about the size of football, and I think, again, like people look at someone like Marcus Rashford, who's on, let's say, 300 grand a week or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and that's somewhere in the region of 15 to 18 million pounds a year, roughly, in that, in that ballpark. That isn't huge money, really, in, in terms of actual big businesses. You're totally right. Oil and technology and that kind of You're business. You're totally right. You're totally yeah. the, the, the CEOs of like big co corporations are walking away with hundreds of millions of pounds. Yeah. And the, I'll tell you now, any, any kid, any boy that gets on that football pitch, they've earned it. You know, you, you go and be a professional footballer then. Do you yeah. know what, it is? what they've had to do to get to where they are? Yeah. You know, if they want to go on the pitch and let themselves down, they, they've already earned that money. They've already, they, that's, their, that's their thing. You, you, we're having a go at these boys. They represent us. And you look at the upward kind of like, all the best teams, all, sorry, all the best players in world football and all the best coaches are just being sucked upwards. Mm. There's no romance anymore. And, you know, like you said, you said it perfectly about... about it's just a case of let's try and get as much money as we can and try and buy the best players from around the world. And you know what? Another weird thing about this whole system is even the rich clubs are all in debt. Yeah. We don't need to have any debt. If we can just think about a different way of doing football, a different way of collating the money that it generates, a different way of doing business, here's a good, here's a good idea, right? A really simple idea. Give away 10% ownership rights to foreigners so they get to own 10% of your club. You pay £10 a month, they pay £1 a month. Man United have got supposedly, according to loads of research firms, of somewhere in the region of 650 million supporters around the world. If 500 million paid £1 a month, £6 billion a year goes into my United coffers. You know, mm. this is a bloody good idea. So, so how is... Because people are going to be looking at this thinking, this is sort of socialism, this is what, you know, whatever it is, and therefore no one's ever going to, you know, is it basically taking away the advantage that United have and that have built, you know, that they've built up through being successful for 50, 60, 70 years? It's not just a case of, you know, United haven't had rich owners come in and give us loads of money. In fact, we've had quite the opposite until recently. Our owners have taken money out of the club. How is this fair to a team like Manchester United compared to, you know, I can see why it's a great idea for an Ipswich or a Southampton or someone like that where they get a, a fairer share of what's going on. But are you sort of unfairly taking away the advantages that a team like Man United have built up through decades of being, I hate to say well run of the Glazers, but, you know, we're here because of the, the success of the past, not because we've had it all given to us on a plate. Well... There's a few things to say about that. And one is that, you know, Ferguson spent a hell of a lot of money. You've always had a lot of money. Yeah. You've always had a big spending advantage. Uh, just, a, just a quick tangent before we go back to that. I showed you earlier a, a really nice um, graphic of, um, of the biggest attendances in, world, in English football going right through the ages. And when you were relegated in the 1970s, you still had the biggest attendance mm. out of all the clubs. And, that, and that's the Man United fan base I'm talking to right now. They're the people that need to get involved in this. In terms of uh, losing your advantage, you won't. You'll still have a big one. First of all, we're going to be paying the highest wages in world football. Second of all, on the designated player rule, when you, I've said you, know, you can spend 25% of your club's profits because uh, you'll have your own commercial profits. You'll own all of your, your, your commercial agenda is incredible. If you've got £6 billion coming in, what's 25% of that? You, if you could spend that on three, four, five players, mm. you've got those million pound, two million pound a week contracts, no problem. The only thing is you've got to play your own boys, but you, you, this is a big area. So you, you've already got inbuilt advantage, but I suppose really what I'm saying is this, give some of it up. Yeah. We should be giving some of it up. It should be fairer. And that, that is, is that not noble? You know, and, and that's what sports about. It's supposed to be an air, an arena where there is a bit of fairness and a, a bit of equality. This is how the Victorians did it. This is how the Americans do it now. We've we've had our mindsets changed considerably. What I'm saying to my United fans here is this: you can control the ethics and moral landscape of your club because right now you can't. Mm. It, it's a, it's foreign businessmen dictating what happens, and whatever you think Man United is, it's dead. It's dead. It's not what it was. It's completely changed. It's, it's, a, 
it's a commercial venture, you know. And I think we've all become these passive consumer zombies, mm. and you know we're not we're not we're more consumers than we are football supporters these days, and that's what I'm trying to change. And I think if the people, for a lot of people, they're not as interested or deeply passionate about football clubs, a European Super League agenda is fine, and there's no right or wrong way to connect with football. But for those of us who have a spiritual connection that's been going down through generations, you know, passed down, football is not just a commercial product. It's 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 spiritual, you know. And for those of us, for, for those of us, sorry, who feel like that, I think there's something worth fighting for here. I think we can a do the commercial agenda even better, mm. and b create an even more special landscape in which we can all compete on a more equal footing and we can earn our victories properly, not having bought for us by Americans or Middle Eastern oil. Right, Mickey, thank you. It's been brilliant chatting to you. Thanks, mate. Can I, can I say one thing about the book? Absolutely, Is that right? yeah, of course. If you want to hold it up, it's um, yeah. we need um, as many pre-orders as we can yep. so uh, we can get the audio book. The, 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 I'll just be totally honest, it's about being honest. They want 2,000 um, pre-orders before the audio. And a lot of people are struggling with concentration spans these days and trying to get people to read a book is difficult. But uh, I'm 500 in. Uh, I went to the Leeds United fan base. We got we got 400 pre-orders. And I'm hoping that the Man United one can take us over that 2,000 and we can get that uh, audio book ready for early December mm -hmm. so people can listen, you know, in, in, um, in the cars or whatever yeah. on the way to work. But if you can read a book or if you're up for it or you want to hide from your family at Christmas, that's what you do, mate. And you can get it. Just type in Football the People's Shame and, yeah. um, and, and please get it pre-ordered. And, and thanks so much mm. for having me on. I really appreciate no, it. No, thanks for coming on. And, yeah, make sure you, you check out Mickey's book. Really interesting stuff in there. And, again, whether you agree with it or disagree with it or it just changes the way you look at football and you, you learn something about what football has become, it's a very, very interesting topic and uh, something I'm really glad you've come on to share with us. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Cheers. Thank you for joining us at home as well. Hit subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you in a bit.